So welcome. Um, and don't worry, they can't hear what you're saying, only what I'm saying. <laughs> so I'll, I'll uh, repeat any questions that you might have. Um, but this is our, um, I can't remember actually what number workshop this is, but we're going to be talking today about uh, accessible PowerPoints. Um, so the tips you're going to get today are um, things that you can do to your PowerPoint, relatively simple things that um, you can do to ensure that if a student opens up your PowerPoint and they use a screen reader, like for, for example, if they're blind or um, have a vision impairment, uh, and they they use a screen reader to read your PowerPoint, that it's going to read in the way that you would want it to, not out of order, um, <laughs> which can be very confusing. Um, so. And then at the end of the, uh, towards the end of the session, um, I have a sample PowerPoint that for two, both of you sitting here, um, I put it onto your desktop. And for you ladies, I'll put it onto your desktop uh, when we start the practice portion. And um, I have a little sort of assignment for you at the end of the packet. So that'll be fun. So I'm going to start off by um, showing you the um, online accessibility at DVC website, which is something you can refer to at any time for assistance with what I'm going to talk about with you today and also other things. And the URL for this is just uh, www.dvc.edu slash online accessibility. I know on the URL that you're seeing on the screen, it's a little bit longer, but just slash online accessibility will get you there. It's also located if you click under faculty and staff on the main DVC homepage, you know, at the top. And then if you scroll down a little bit under general information, you'll see a link to it as well. And it's in bold because it's relatively new. So this web page um, is meant for faculty and staff to help you sort of um, accessibilize your online content. Um, I do want to stress to you, though, that it is not your responsibility to be accessibility experts, okay? Um, we are not expecting that. The whole purpose of this is to just give you a few simple things that you can do in various aspects of your um, materials creation to make your course um, more um, equitable for students with certain disabilities. But DSS, Disability Support Services, can fully support you in any of these endeavors. So um, don't feel as though you have to go home tonight and make a thousand changes to your course. That's not possible and it's not required either. Um, but slowly, if we begin to all work together uh, over time, then we'll get closer and closer to um, perfect courses as I'd like to think. Okay, so what I wanted to do is start out by just going into module three, which is accessible PowerPoint presentations. Some of you might be Mac users, and that's fine. Um, there are two different avenues you could take from this site. One is for Windows users or people using a PC, and then one is for Mac users. Um, if you don't have the specific version number, like 2016, for example, don't worry. A lot of the things I'm going to show you are relatively the same for 2013 or previous versions um, for Mac. But the college is turning over all of our versions to these ones. Um, okay, I'm going to go to the Windows one because I'm on a PC and that seems to be what a lot of people use. But again, all of these topics are also covered for Mac. Um, so, um, we're just going to settle upon this really briefly, but there are a few formatting basics that you want to be mindful of when you're creating your presentation, and these are helpful for anybody, not just students with disabilities. Um, they're kind of just best practices when creating PowerPoints. I'm sure we've all had situations where we saw a PowerPoint and it was just like tons of stuff on the slide, and you're going, what? You know, and then they change the slide, and you think, well, I was just halfway through reading that. Um, you know, it's, so it, it can be too text heavy. You can also have the opposite problem where you have too much going on, where it's like animations, like things bursting, you know, and like sounds. And it's just like, whoa, what are you trying to, you know, just tell me what you need me to know. So um, in terms of font type, it's good to stick with 30 point or above. Um, that's really helpful for everybody, but especially for students who may have slight visual impairments. Um, Try not to use a whole bunch of fonts on one slide. Try to stick with one or two. Um, again, that's more of just like a clarity issue. 
let's talk a little bit more about font. Um, when in doubt, a lot of, there's a lot of schools of thought about what is the best font to use for students with dyslexia or, or um, other types of um, cognitive impairments. You're going to, depending on what you Google, you're going to find different points of view. Some people think you should never use fonts with serifs, which are like the little tails, right? Some people ha have heard that, well, that actually helps people read better. Who knows? Um, one thing that most people agree on is that um, if you're using a font like Arial, it can be a little tricky sometimes because um, the I's and the L's can kind of blend together. So if you want to be like an accessibility rock star and you really want to incorporate this into all aspects of your practice, Verdana is a good method or a good one to choose because there's no serifs and um, the I's and the L's are, are distinctive. So just, just a little thing. Now, again, if you don't, if you use Times New Roman, you're not going to get dinged by the federal government for violating accessibility laws. Um, these are just suggestions. Some things you will get dinged for. <laughs> um, and we're not really going to go into the legal aspect of it today, but there are some uh, accessibility things you want to be mindful of, like captioning videos, which we've talked about in previous uh, workshops, um, and uh, providing alternate text for images, which we're going to do today. OK. Um, in lesson two, oh, and sorry, one more word about this, contrast. Um, PowerPoint, a lot of times, you know, we get, we tend to get creative with colors. Um, there are some tools, there is one free tool called Color Contrast Analyzer that's very easy to use, where you literally click on two sections of your, uh, of, of, you click on your text color and you click on your background color and it'll tell you if it, if it's okay. Um, I apologize, I don't have that in here right now. I'm currently working on that to add to the website. So please look out for that. But these are free tools that are super easy to use. Um, it's called Color Contrast Analyzer, and it's actually an Australian product. The Australians, Catherine, if you haven't been able to tell so far, seem to be kind of on the forefront of a lot of this stuff. So it's color, C-O-L-O-U-R. And analyzer is with an S, <laughs> not Z. Because, you know, Australia. And I'm not going to spend all day, all of your time, just going through the, the website that's already there. Um, but I figured why create recreate the wheel if I have already kind of spelled some of this stuff out. Another topic that you want to be mindful of with PowerPoint presentations is using standard slide layouts. So this is a safe space. We can all admit it. How many of us, when we've made a PowerPoint, have just gone to create a blank slide and then we added in our own stuff? It's okay. <laughs> this is a safe space. Um, that's normally fine. Um, it's not recommended though from an accessibility standpoint and here's why. You might have noticed, actually let me go into my PowerPoint so I can show you this. Just go to a blank presentation. Okay, so when we open PowerPoint by default, we see that we have um, a standard slide layout. It's our standard title slide. And then when we go to new slide, we have different choices. Now, I am always tempted to just go to blank. I don't know why. I just feel like I have more creative freedom over it, um, which is fine, but you're going to have to do a little extra just to make sure that it's going to read properly. The issue with using a blank one as opposed to one of these standard layouts, and I believe there's uh, eight of them. So there's eight of them that you're presented with right away. Um, if you click on new slide and then the drop down arrow right under it, you have all of these choices that you can just pick. But most people, well, I shouldn't say most people, a lot of people, myself included, um, usually pick blank because I, I don't want to be confined to what they're telling me to put. Um, the only issue with that is if you opt to use a blank template and then you add in things PowerPoint, or I should say a screen reader, may not read it in the order that you intended. It will only read it in the order you added it. So if you add in things and then go and f change them around, it's going to read it in the order you added it. Now, I'll, that might be a little confusing. Let me demonstrate for you. I had made a video that illustrated this point. So let me just expand it. And I think my captions are on. So I'd like to show you this uh, real quick. 
Cool. When I approach the slide, I will want to read this one first, this one second, this one third. Um, but remember, that wasn't the order in which they were added to my slide. So um, now I'm going to turn on my screen reading software program, in this case it's JAWS, and I will demonstrate for you how JAWS will read this slide to someone um, who can't necessarily see the screen. Okay, so I've now turned on my JAWS program. I currently have it on mute. Um, so I'm about to unmute it, and then I will play the slideshow from the current slide. Slide 2. This was added first. This was added second. This was added third. Okay, so from that uh, JAWS reading, you could hear that JAWS read the two text boxes first, and then the word art which is not how it appears on the screen. So hopefully this demonstrated for you uh, some of the risks that would be involved in using a blank slide template. Okay, so um, you could see from that how it read it. So um, let's see. No, it's fine. So um, if you already have a, a blank slide, hold on one moment, just close this out. Correct. So if you already have a blank slide, um, it, don't worry, it's fine. But what we're going to want to do is go and check the reading order and then rearrange things if you find that it's out of order. So um, it's okay to use a blank slide, but the, the, the nice thing about using a standard slide layout is that it's going to be more um, PowerPoint already has assigned placeholders to all those things, so it's going to most likely read in an order that you intended if you fill in those those elements. Um, so some of you have been to our other workshops about Word and using styles, like where it uh, assigns like a heading to certain things. So um, standard style layouts are kind of like PowerPoint's version of version of slides, where it the, the computer already knows a picture is going to go here or a chart and a title is going to go here so it already has headings assigned to certain things. Um, okay so then the rest of the, um, the this lesson goes shows you screenshots of actually how to apply standard slide layouts and the same would go for the Mac one. Um, so next I would like to um, talk about reviewing reading order and so this is what you would do. Um, I mean, it's a good idea to do even if you use standard slide layouts, but if you've used a blank slide, you're just going to want to go and, and perform this process to review it. So um, the other thing, too, is you notice that when you rearrange placeholders, it's still going to read in the order it was added. Um, or if you delete one um, and it'll look like it's not there anymore, uh, it still might read in a different order. Um, so again, just a good idea to do. And this goes over how to do that. Um, and let me take, I think I have, okay, I have a video for this too. So um, here's a series of screenshots. It's very simple. You just go into the drawing group on your home tab. And there's a button under that that says arrange. And in the, when you click arrange, there's a, um, an item under that that says selection pane. And if you happen to have PowerPoint up, you, again, you don't have to, but you can check all this stuff out, and then you'll be practicing this today as well. So if you click Selection Pane, it's going to give you, to the right, um, uh, a menu that shows all of the elements that are on your page. They won't necessarily have um, the text that you've typed into those elements, but they'll have what the placeholder is called. So I know this is a little small, but in this case, I have Title 1, and then I have Subtitle 2. Now, one thing I found tricky about this is that title, whatever's on the bottom of this list is what's going to be read first. And then what's above that is read second. And then what's above that is read last. Now, I, for, for myself, I found that confusing because I naturally thought what was on top would be read first. But it's the other way around. So that's why I tried to make this really obvious. This is going to be read first. This is going to be read last. Now, if you find that they're out of order, and this is simple because I only have two elements on this page. If you find things are out of order, it's so simple. You just literally click on the element and drag it to its proper placement, keeping in mind that the bottom one is read first, going up, and then what's ever on top is read last. This one is correct. 
Sorry, Jenny, go ahead. Right. So what the what you're referring to and just for the people listening so on our slide it's clear this is the title our title is written larger i guess i should point to it with the mouse here the title is larger and then the subtitles below so then if you go over to the selection pane this is correct because the title is what will be read first okay yeah so this one is right but again if you find it wrong it's easy to to reorder it and i think I, in the video i demonstrate that so um Oh, actually, and then if you look right down here, you can click and drag the elements, or you can also just um, s click on the element you want to move, and then use your up and down arrows. Um, okay, so let me show you this. This is really brief, this video, and it kind of demonstrates moving them around. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to review the reading order for the items on your PowerPoint slide to ensure that screen reading software will read them in the order you intended. The example I'll use is the same slide I created in the video in Module 2, in which I used a blank slide template and manually added in two text boxes and one word art box, and then rearranged their positioning on the slide. I labeled each item to show the order in which I added them to the slide. Note that the order added does not reflect the order in which they appear on the slide. So to review the reading order, first click on the Arrange button in the Home tab, then locate the Selection Pane button. Clicking the Selection Pane button will show you to the right a listing of each item on the slide. The item at the bottom of the list would be read first by a screen reader, and the item at the top would be read last. Clicking each item once in the list will show you which item it is referring to on the slide. If a screen reader were to read this slide now, according to this list, it would read text box 1 first, followed by text box 2, and then the word art. Looking at the slide tells us that this is not the order we want. To fix this, in the selection pane, click once on the item you wish to move. In this case, I'll click on rectangle 4, which is my word art, and then use the up and down arrows to adjust its position. So if I click the down arrow twice, that will bring my rectangle 4, which is my word art, down to the bottom of the list. And now this will be read first, which is how it appears on the slide. Once you are satisfied with the order, simply close the selection pane window and your changes will be applied. Thank you so much. Okay, Okay. so um, again, not a super complicated process. I know it's a little overkill, but um, you know, it, it helps to practice. Um, okay, so you're going to be doing that as well in the practice activity that I'm going to have you do. I, I have a uh, PowerPoint slide of how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, which is educational. <laughs> so we'll be doing that. Um, the last thing I want to show you, though, that is sort of one of the big tenets of creating an accessible PowerPoint is how to handle images. So images are prevalent in PowerPoints. That's a lot of times why we use PowerPoint, because we want to show, you know, um, paintings or charts or whatever. Um, so the thing to know about images, and the same goes for Word, is you want to add alternate text to that image or that chart. Um, because if you don't, the screen reader is just going to, to let the listener know that there's an image there, but they won't tell them what it is. So you need to take the extra step of telling, uh, of assigning rather, sort of a label to that image. And in this case, we call that alternate text. Um, and here's, here's sort of a, uh, an example. You don't want to repeat what is already in a caption, unless the caption pretty much describes what is that pic what's in that picture, in which case your work is done. Um, but sometimes captions don't accurately convey what the picture is about. Like in this sense, it's a painting. This is a famous painting. And the caption says, in this painting, the artist Emmanuel Lutz, I think I'm saying that right, used light and color to convey motion. But that's not telling us anything about what this was actually in this painting. 
And I know a picture's worth a thousand words, but do the best that you can. You don't have to write a novel, um, but think of what the take home message that you want conveyed by showing that chart or that, that painting is. In this case, I wrote, I know it's a little, my color contrast would probably not pass this test, <laughs> but in Omni Update, when you put in a block quote, it makes it really gray. What's that? I did write this. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it took a whole day just to draft this one statement. Um, so George Washington looks forward with a determined gaze. This is, oh, yeah, this is like way hyperbolic. As his wary troops row their small craft across the Delaware River and into battle. The light of dawn, swirling water, and jagged icebergs add a dramatic effect. Okay, so is the student going to get a, a, could they definitely repeat back to me exactly what the picture looks like? Maybe not, but if this were an art history class, you might be discussing, you know, using light to create effect and, and you know, um, how is Washington standing and what does that show you? Um, so again, do your best, but then when a screen reader, uh, so the student, the screen reader um, and the one that you heard in the video, the one previously is called JAWS, which stands for Job Access with Speech. It's one of the most popular screen readers on the market. I'm going to use another one today to, to demonstrate something else that is free. JAWS is not free. Um, but the, I'm going to show you one today that is free that's becoming more and more popular. Um, but when a screen reader is going down and reading the text, if it comes to an image that has alternate text attached to it, it's going to read that um, as opposed to just blank or image. OK, so then adding it is very simple. Um, you simply just right click the image and a menu appears that's and you can click on format picture and once you do that um, the this little button right here is called the layout and properties button you would not know that unless you actually hovered your mouse over it because <laughs> much fewer things are labeled now but if you click that you will see a box that appears that says alt text and it's simple you can just type in to those to these boxes what your alt text is now there's a section for a title and a section for a description not always necessary to do both if it's a chart and the chart has a definite title then yeah you can add the title and then the description you know maybe a couple sentences about what you want that chart to convey or what that chart's trying to convey um, but if it's just an image like company logo or something like that then title is fine you don't have to go into the description. If it's a, a really complicated chart that's going to require a lot of explanation, um, you may consider maybe typing out like a longer description and, and giving that to the student um, or, you know, I, again, I would encourage you to just really think of like, like in a supply and demand chart. What is the takeaway message you want someone to know about that? When supply goes up, uh, well, I mean, sorry, when demand goes up, um, or I'm sorry, when supply goes up, demand goes down. See, I should take econ again. Um, but you know, <laughs> you don't have to get super long winded with this stuff. But again, if you have something really complicated and you're thinking, I don't know how to convey this to someone who can't see it, let us know. We can help you. Um, for for math folks as well, we also have um, embossing machines. This isn't related to PowerPoint, but that we can take um, your chart um, and create a raised version of it on paper that a student can can feel. Um, I have one in my office right now. I'm going to be doing a, a workshop on accessible STEM in a few weeks. Um, I think that's the one right before Thanksgiving. So I don't know if people will still be here, but um, I'm going to bring in some samples of these alternate materials, alternative materials that we have. Yeah, good question. So actually, let me repeat the, the, the former question before that too. So the question that Jenny asked was that George Washington blurb that, that I wrote, which would that, would that go in description? And the answer is yes. I don't think I would necessarily need a title for that. Although I think the name of that painting is Washington Crossing the Delaware. So maybe I could add that as the title. I should have probably added that. But so that's a good question. Then the next question was, is this something that everyone's going to have access to? Um, and the answer to that is no. Um, <laughs> so like that beautiful, you know, really hyperbolic statement that I wrote, um, 
nobody would hear that unless uh, unless they were using a screen reader. Now you might think, wow, everyone should hear that right? Um, so you can add that in. If you, if you add that like underneath the, the picture, then you don't have to add alt text. It's just if you don't have that, then you would have to describe what it's for. But some people are like, well, I think everyone should know that, so I'm going to put it in. S S okay, so a PowerPoint converted into a PDF file. If you have the placeholders, if you've used the placeholders that are labeled as like title, okay, but that's okay. Um, if you do use those placeholders, they're going to carry over. So a screen reader will read title and then, you know, stuff like that. Um, we talked a little bit about create, creating um, accessible PDFs. Was that last week? Gosh, time is running away from me. Okay, yeah. We talked about that last week. So there are ways, once something's been converted to a PDF, if it wasn't already created in an accessible way, you can make it accessible once it's already in PDF. Remember we talked about using the make accessible wizard and well I mean that's a common practice converting PowerPoints to PDF is common practice um, but what, for students who are blind a better way to do it like if you if you know there's a student in your class who's blind and, and you're going to be sending them the PowerPoint or you're going to be posting it onto um, Canvas is to just post it as a PowerPoint file and then they can download it and then all of these, you know, because there are specific command, keyboard commands for how to read a PowerPoint presentation in JAWS and in the other program I'm going to show you. Um, so a trained JAWS user, and if it's someone who uses JAWS, they are trained in it because it's not an easy program to to navigate if you don't know what you're doing. Um, most students with pretty severe visual impairments have already gone to through extensive training in these technologies, so they will know what they need to press to go to the next slide or to read all the placeholders. So um, it, it depends on the disability. If it's a blind person, I would say not, <laughs> unless you've done some work on it. But typically PDF are, are not friendly for people who are blind. Um, but Word documents, um, you know, in their, in their source format are typically friendlier. I, right. Well, but so, but you have them, so you created it in its own, in its native format originally. So you had a Word document and then you convert it to PDF. So you still have those source documents. So if you needed to, if a student came to you and said, you know, professor, I, um, <clears throat> can you send me this file in a Word document format because that my, my Braille note will read it better that way or my screen reader will read it better that way. You have it and you easily can just send it off to them. So I'm not trying to suggest that you shouldn't ever convert anything to PDF anymore. You can certainly do that, but you know, make sure that you still have those source files if the need arises. Okay, so um, I have a video of this too. I, I don't think I need to show you that, but if you like to see things being done step by step, then you can certainly access that. The next two lessons go over hyperlinks and then how to deal um, with, I think, charts. I think I talked about that a little bit, but um, at this point, what we're going to do, let me go back and make sure that I, yeah, hyperlinks and tables and charts. And again, the tables and charts instructions are kind of similar to the um, alternate, uh, t how to deal with images and alternate text. Um, but there's a, f a little more um, in terms of how to get to where you add the alternate text, like you have to know where to click and all these things. So that explains that. Um, what I would like to do right now to be mindful of your time is if you flip to the back of your handout, um, I don't have one, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm glad I gave them all out. Okay, Jenny's going to share. I just need to read this real quick. Thank you. So the back page says, let's practice some of the skills we've discussed today. You can refer to module three in the online accessibility at DVC webpage, which I have up here, or this handout, because again, everything that I've talked about is, is in this. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is probably end my recording and I'll come around to those of you who I haven't added the peanut butter and jelly PowerPoint to. And what I'd like you to do is check, practice checking the reading order for the items on that slide and then rearrange them if necessary to create the most logical reading order. <laughs> and then last but not least, add an alternate text to the image. I'm going to mute the, I'm going to stop my recording now and then I'll put it onto your um, machines and then um, maybe I can play it for you again at the end if we have some time. So thanks for your, thank you listening audience and we'll see you next time.